So good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to host another CTP colloquium. Today, our our speaker is uh, Dr. Dorota Skowron, who is uh, who works at the Astronomical Observatory of Warsaw University, uh, and this is where she also obtained her PhD, and after which she was uh, at Ohio State University for a postdoc, and then she came back uh, to work. At, at the observatory, she works with uh, different on on, the, on different things, but mostly as as far as I know, but she can correct me on uh, on variable stars. And today we will hear about how she uses the, this type of stars to map the Milky Way. Dorota, the the screen <laughs> is yours. Thank you, Maciek. Uh, hello, and thank you for inviting me uh, to the colloquium. I will. I will start with uh, sharing my screen. So as Maciek uh, said, I uh, research mainly variable stars and he, uh, today I would like to tell you about uh, how we used classical Cephates uh, to map our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So we live in uh, the solar system, which is located in the plane of our galaxy. So it is very difficult uh, to observe and map our galaxy because we live just within the disk. And as you see, uh, the Milky Way is a bright band across the night sky. And it's not just full of stars, but it's also full of dust and gas that uh, obscures the light that comes from uh, the stars to the observer. So it is very difficult to tell uh, uh, tell anything about the structure of uh, the Milky Way in the indirect way. But uh, we do know that we live in a spiral galaxy and here you see a sample of spiral galaxies observed uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope. So we know we live uh, within a spiral galaxy because we observe such galaxies in the universe. But we also do have uh, some knowledge from indirect observations within our galaxy, of course. And uh, this is, for example, observations of uh, clouds of neutral hydrogen or uh, counts of stars along the line of sight. But all these uh, observations uh, that lead to some knowledge about the structure of the Milky Way disk are based on some assumptions, uh, are dependent on the models that are used to predict the structure of the Milky Way. And because of this, uh, the images of our galaxy, which you see here, these are mostly some artistic visions of what our galactic disk could look like. And these images differ um, between each other. Some of them have four spiral arms, some of them have two spiral arms. And uh, uh, the pitch angle, the, the degree of uh, how tightly the arms are wrapped around the uh, disk is also different. Even the size of the galactic disks is different between uh, various uh, models uh, based on different observations. So we would like to, ideally, we would like to have some sample of objects that could map the Milky Way without having to assume any uh, physical quantities about our galaxy. And there are these stars, variable stars called classical Cephades. They are very bright, young, supergiant stars that pulsate radially. And here you have an example of the closest classical Cephade to, our, to us, and this is the North Star, Polaris. And just below it is the Sun, uh, to compare the what, what it's like uh, to be a main sequence star, that is the Sun, and the uh, uh, bright supergiant, which is uh, classical Cephade. Excuse me, we have a question by... Okay. So, okay, so we do interrupt uh, with questions. Uh, in, yes, uh, or we well, wait yes. For... if somebody has an urgent question. Is, okay. Is, are you okay with that, Dorota? Yes, that's fine. Just, okay, just yes. yeah, uh, sure, sure. Thanks, Julius, I, I didn't see it. Yes, please, Lech. Uh, well, that's just a very short comment. It's not yet 100 years from December 30th, 1924, when uh, Hubble realized that Andromeda is uh, another galaxy. So that uh, Milky Way, we are not alone, that Milky Way is not the whole universe. 
Yes, that's somewhat yes. amazing because because uh, if you think about the, the the development of cosmology in those hundred years, this is for me it's absolutely amazing. Yes, I agree. It's completely it's amazing. It's not yet it was... hundred years, ninety-seven years. Yes, it was it in the fifties or so. No, no, earlier. Like it was uh, December thirteenth, uh, nineteen twenty-four. I was searching Wikipedia <laughs> okay. when you were talking and and and, mm -hmm. and found that day. And uh, another interesting thing is that uh, first observations of neutral hydrogen, of the distribution of neutral hydrogen, were in the late fifties of, of the past century, uh, when uh, when people realized that uh, we live in a galaxy and. The first observa radio observations when that were done only some 70 years ago. So that's not so long ago. Um, okay, so uh, some physical properties of classical Cepheids. They are young, uh, very young, um, less than 400 million years, uh, very massive, uh, up to 20 solar masses, and very luminous from 100 to 10,000 solar luminosities. And their pulsation period is from about one to 100 days. Uh, what do you, what is a pulsation? A pulsation means that a star is uh, regularly changing its uh, size, uh, brightness, and the temperature of the surface. And on the right, you have a model of a pulsating star, a classical Cepheid. And on the left, there is uh, the light curve, that is the change of the star's brightness with time. And you see that the light curve of a classical Cepheid is very characteristic. It's, uh, it's a, it has this triangular shape and makes it very easy to identify among thousands, millions of uh, other variable stars that we observe uh, each day. Excuse me, what is the period of this? Uh, this one, I, uh, that's not, uh, that is not um, important here. And I, yeah, I, yeah, it's just course, a random. Roughly speaking. Years. Okay, so so years. from it's about one day to a hundred days for classical uh -huh. Cepheids. Okay. And this was probably some ten day year, uh, ten day uh, period Cepheid. But uh, generally, it's uh, the from one to a hundred days, more or less. So, why these classical Cepheids are good for distance determinations? Because that is what we need to map the galaxy. We need to determine distances. And the main property uh, of that, that is used for distance determinations is the period luminosity relation that is obeyed by classical Cepheids. And it allows for direct distance determination that, that is independent of any assumptions. And this is also why we call classical Cepheids uh, standard candles for, distance, for determining distances in the universe, not only in our galaxy, but also in other galaxies. And this is an example of such a period luminosity relation. On the x-axis, we have a logarithm of period. And on the y-axis, there is the Fasen height index, which is an equivalent of brightness. And you see that uh, there are a number of tight uh, relations. The blue uh, dots are for classical Cepheids pulsating in the fundamental mode. And uh, the different colors are from for overtones. And these relations are very tight, uh, very well defined, and uh, very, st very uh, straightforward. It's just a re linear, re linear relation between the logarithm of period and uh, uh, luminosity. So how do we determine the distance? Uh, we have the pulsation period P from, uh, this is from um, observations of the light curve. Uh, we need, uh, to have at least 100 and, or 200 points per star, per star uh, distributed across its pulsation uh, cycle uh, to determine the period. Uh, we have the sm small m, which is the observed magnitude, and it depends on the wavelength, m lambda. And we have something called, uh, which we mark with a big A, it's an interstellar extinction. I will tell about it later, uh, but it is the absorption and scattering of light between the star and the observer. So having the period, we can calculate the uh, absolute magnitude, which is the kind of an intrinsic luminosity of the object from the period luminosity relation. And then uh, when we have the observed 
luminosity with a telescope that calculated absolute luminosity from the uh, from the period, and we know the extinction. This is, this is very straightforward to calculate the distance. Uh, the recipe is really very simple. Uh, so why else are classical cephates good for determining distances? They are very bright, and this is very important because we can find them across our entire galactic disk out to the edges. And they can, we can see them even through clouds of dust and gas because they are so bright. And then, as I already showed, they are fairly easy to separate from other kinds of variable stars because they have very characteristic light curves. So if we observe the sky for a couple of years and have a couple of hundred data points per star, we uh, can be sure that we observe a classical Cephate, not a different variable star. And for here also you have some uh, examples of uh, classical Cephates. Uh, uh, this, the left column is the fundamental mode, which is the, uh, the easiest to detect. Uh, and depending on the period, which is maybe not so well visible here on the right, but depending on the period, the change of the light curve is uh, slight, but still uh, we have the templates and we know exactly that these are classical Cephates. So uh, coming back to the biggest uncertainty that is, uh, uh, that is in the distance determination, that is the extinction, which is wavelength dependent, of course. Uh, we see that there, are, uh, there is a lot of dust and gas in the galaxies. Here you'll see an image of a spiral galaxy and a, with a naked eye, we see how dense the disk is, how, how much interstellar medium is in that galaxy. And if we look at one of the ogle images of the sky here, this is an image toward the center of the galaxy, you see lots of stars. This is a very, very dense uh, region of sky. But then you see patches of sky which are completely black. There are no stars there. And it's not that there are no stars, it's just that the, there are so dense clouds of gas and dust that they block the light from the stars that are behind them. So how can we tackle the, uh, this, uh, this uh, inter interstellar extinction? So we can use mid-infrared data from space. So there are two satellites, uh, Spitzer and WISE, uh, that observe the sky in the mid-infrared and uh, if we had the infrared data for the classical cephates that could be used to determine the distances, the input from the extinction would be very small. And here is uh, just to show you how, what, is, what the order of magnitude here is. On the x-axis, there is the wavelength uh, for of observations. And on the x-axis here, there is the relative uh, extinction relative to the K band. So this region from uh, three and a half microns up to 20, uh, 24 microns is the observations from space. And uh, this, these are the mid infrared bands of the Spitzer and Weiss satellites. And here the extinction is, uh, is uh, very stable and it's very low. But as we go to optical bands here, the extinction curve is very steep. Uh, note that this scale is logarithmic. So uh, if we go to the I band, which is the wavelength of Ogle observations, uh, we are probably somewhere here with the extinction 10 times uh, larger than in the infrared. That's why we want to go to infrared for determining distances to minimize the effects of extinction. But even though we will minimize the errors on the distances, the extinction is still there. Uh, and fortunately, there are well-determined period luminosity relations uh, in the infrared. And um, there are also uh, extinction maps for the infrared bands. They are very difficult to construct for the optical, but in the infrared where the, the extinction is much lower, we can uh, fairly easily, may, maybe not easily, but we can construct those uh, infrared uh, 
uh, extinction maps, and there are available extinction maps in the literatures that we could use. So the two steps is to minimize the uh, effect of extinction by going to the infrared and then also use the extinction maps that are available. So uh, now you uh, probably have uh, noticed that distance and extinction would be color cor correlated. So if we want to calculate the distance, we have to um, do it iteratively. And uh, so first we calculate uh, the distance to a cephate uh, separately for every available infrared band. So Spitzer observes in uh, four bands and Wise observes in four bands from uh, three and a half to about 24 microns. And uh, these are Wise four bands and Spitzer four bands. So for each band, we calculate the distance to, an, uh, to a given cephate independently using the period luminosity relation determined for that band. And we assume there is no extinction initially. Uh, then we calculate the mean distance from all those eight separate distances. This is a weighted average of those separate distances with a three sigma outlier rejection. And after we have this preliminary distance, we use the extinction map, the infrared extinction map to, uh, to extract a lambda for that distance because the extinction depends on distance. So, and thus we have uh, the first estimation of a lambda. And after that, we go to the first step. So we recalculate all individual distances and their mean with uh, this extinction value. So this is the second step. Then we repeat the process and extract the, for that new distance, extract the new um, extinction value and so on until the process converges to to a stable value. This is how we determine the distance. Now we know the uh, method. Now we need classical cephates. Uh, so the uh, the cephate sample was uh, constructed uh, mainly from the oval observations. And on this image, you see the uh, oval telescope and the Milky Way above it. This uh, telescope is located in Las Campanas Observatory in Chile and it's, observe, it's been observing the, the southern sky since 25 years. And for the, uh, there was a dedicated campaign, six year campaign to observe the galactic disk uh, in order to find all classical cephates that can be found in the galactic disk. And because these observations were uh, for the for six years, we can be sure that we found all objects. So the uh, catalog is uh, complete and it's pure because the, these are very high quality observations and there is no, and the photometry, the, the light groups are uh, of uh, very high quality. So the classification is, uh, is uh, unambiguous. And here with uh, yellow dots, you see the cephites that had been located in the Milky Way disk. Uh, if we plot it in the galactic coordinates where the plane of the galaxy is uh, here, horizontal axis. So these are galactic coordinates. The galactic center is uh, in the middle. You see those uh, dense clouds uh, of interstellar matter uh, in the center and the background image is from the Gaia satellite. So the yellow points are those classical cephates that were, cephates that were found by Ogle. And blue dots are classical cephates from other surveys. Uh, first of all, this part of the image is uh, unavailable to Ogle observations because it's uh, visible from the northern hemisphere. And there are some blue dots uh, around here that are very bright cephates that would saturate in uh, the Ogle images. So we're too bright. And in numbers, it is about 1,500 oval cephates and uh, about uh, 1,000 other cephates resulting in a large sample of almost 2,400 objects, uh, over 2,400 objects. And if we, so after the process that I uh, told you about, uh, the process of determining distances, uh, you are left with 
uh, 20 to over 2200 uh, surfaced for which we were able to calculate distances. Uh, the sample is smaller because not all uh, classical surfaces had inferred data. So just to repeat, we find and classify classical surfaces in the optical data, but then we use the infrared data from space to calculate distances. That is why these, the, the sample numbers do not agree. And if uh, this, uh, so green points are the are classical surface uh, from the sample, and the background image is just um, a schematic spiral structure based on some uh, current models, just to uh, uh, draw attention. And if and this is the view we can say this is the view from the top. So if we look at the distribution of those green points of classical surface, we see that they do not form the exactly form the spiral arms of the galaxy, but they do form some structures that re resemble the spiral arms of the galaxy. So we, uh, so, uh, so here you have, um, in the previous slide, we had a um, two dimensional distribution of uh, these cephates, but we know the distance to the surface and we know the location on the sky, which means that we have its three-dimensional location in space. So now we will, I will show you how we, uh, how we investigated the three-dimensional distribution of these classical surfaces. We took the sample from the previous image and the small image is the same sample of uh, surfaces uh, seen from the top and we separated uh, them into those uh, pizza slices. Here the sun is marked with a yellow dot and it will be so for all the, for the previous image and for all the subsequent images, the yellow dot is the sun. And we see what happens in those pizza slices for, for cephates in those pizza slices. So we plot uh, for each of the slices. we plot a, a distribution of cephates with respect to the distance from the uh, galactic center. So the x-axis on each of the small plots is the distance from the galactic center. And the y-axis is the vertical distance from the plane of the galaxy, assuming it is just a flat surface. And you see that depending on the slice, there are cephates, some cephates uh, are bent uh, to the south with respect to the plane of the uh, disk, but then in some places they are uh, bent north. Unfortunately, the part, this part of the galactic disk is very uh, uh, unpopulated due to la the lack of observations from the north. But still, we do see that in this region, which is this region and this region, which is representative of the northern uh, side, there is the warping north. So this dotted line here is the line of nodes, which means that on this side, the galaxy is bent um, to the south, as you see in the top panel here. Uh, and in this part, the galaxy is bent to, uh, towards the north. And the warping starts more or less at about 10 kiloparsecs uh, or eight, eight, nine, 10 kiloparsecs, depending where we look, which is about 25,000 light years from the galactic center. And the warping is significant. Uh, it's uh, as, as much as about four and a half thousand light years uh, in the outskirts of the galaxy. And if we plot the same, uh, this, this galaxy model the warp galaxy model in uh, three dimensions, uh, this is what we will see from uh, three different viewing angles. Here the sun is uh, the yellow dot and the circle, here is the approximate sun's orbit around the galactic center. And the, and the gray grid is the surface that it was fit to the, to the data. This is the uh, galactic disk based on classical cephate. And here is a nice uh, animation so that we can see the galactic disk from different viewing angles. 
I hope that this, this goes fairly smoothly on your screens because I know that uh, this movie has trouble sometimes with uh, poor connections. But you see that the galaxy is uh, significantly warped. It, the, its central part, the central part of the disk is flat out to about the sun's distance from the galactic center. But the further we go, the more warped the galactic disk is. Now, uh, after, this, uh, after this was published, we uh, observed this part uh, with a green, marked with a green contour. We observed this part for another the year or two to uh, find additional cephates. And we were able to extend, uh, this is the complete uh, limit of the telescope. Uh, it observes almost uh, in an almost flat position uh, because it's the Northern hemisphere here, but we were able to identify additional 200 cephates in this area. And for 168 of them, we were able to uh, determine distances because there was uh, there were available made inferred data. So these red dots are the new surface, and the blue dots are the is the old sample. And thanks to these new observations, uh, the northern part of the warp is now better constrained. So these new observations fall here or here. So this, that, that's why it was so important for us to to, to observe this additional piece of sky. And uh, I don't have an animation for the new warp, but it's very similar. It's just slightly better constrained uh, in the northern part. What, uh, what else can we tell from the distribution of cephates? So here is a plot with uh, where we see the distance from the galactic center on the x-axis and the vertical distance from the galactic plane on the y-axis. But this time, this is not just the vertical distance from a plane, but from the warped surface. So we subtract the vertical distance uh, uh, of the cephate from the uh, flat surface. We subtract the median warping. So this is the distribution of cephate around the warped disk. And we see that the further we get from the, the further we go from the galactic center, the more dispersed cephates are. And we call this the flaring, that the galactic disk is flared. And from the vertical distribution of cephate, we can also determine the height of the sun above the plane of the galactic disk. So it turns out that the sun is slightly above the galactic. Uh, Plane, it's about 50 light years. Uh, given the flaring of the disk, which is uh, about 500 light years uh, in, along the, uh, in the area of the solar system, the 50 light years is not much. It's just a, a small fraction of the thickness of the disk in our area. But when we are further out in the outskirts of the galactic disk, the flaring is significant. It's almost 3000 light years. Okay, so if we were able to uh, to go out in a spaceship and observe our galaxy from from far away, this is more or less what it would look like. Uh, that the warping of the galactic disks is significant. It's not a negligible effect, just visible with numbers, but it's really a, it would be visible with a naked eye. Uh, and uh, here is the sun and the cephates that were used to constrain the classical the classical cephates that were, were used to constrain the uh, shape of the galactic disk are plotted here with uh, green points. And the background image, uh, interestingly, is another galaxy observed uh, by the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which is similarly warped to our own Milky Way. Uh, another uh, interesting uh, lesson that we learned from classical cephates uh, was uh, supported with uh, data from the Gaia satellite, which observes uh, the motions of stars, both the motions in the sky and uh, radial velocities. And we extracted uh, um, proper motions and radial velocity data for, uh, for the cephates in our sample and calculated the vertical 
uh, velocity uh, of those surfaces. That is their velocity uh, north-south with respect to the uh, galactic disk. And on the left, so on the left side, we, we have uh, the same uh, data as in the previous slides, it's just uh, not for point sources, but it's smooth. The red color here on the left plot is the uh, warp uh, that is uh, towards the north, and the blue is the uh, surface of the galactic disk that is warped, warped south. And on the right axis with red colors, we have uh, vertical velocities that are in the north direction. But in the with the blue color, we have vertical velocities that are in the south direction. So this is int very interesting because it seems that the warping of the galactic disk is still not, uh, the process of warping is still not finished, that we still, uh, that the galaxy is still being more warped than we observe it now. And in some dozens of million years, the warping may be even more significant that uh, is now uh, deducted from classical cephates. So just to summarize the Milky Way disk in numbers, uh, the warping of the disk starts at 25,000 light years from the galactic center and stars in the outer disk are significantly displaced from the plane by up to four and a half thousand light years. Also the disk thickness is not, the disk thickness is not constant. That is what we call flaring, the disk is flared. The disk thickness is about 500 light years near the sun and over 3000 light years at the disk edges. We also learned that the sun is displaced by 50 light years from the galactic plane and also that from the kinematics, we know that the warping is becoming stronger. So this would be, uh, this would be uh, the distribution and uh, the three-dimensional map of the disk from cephates. But there is also another interesting thing that we can learn from classical cephates. If we plot uh, the pulsation periods on the y-axis, the pulsation period, and on the y-axis, the distance from the uh, galactic center, we see that the further we are from the galactic center, the shorter the pulsation periods are, which means that stars that are far from the galactic center pulsate faster than stars that are close to the galactic center. And classical cephates obey this nice period age relation, uh, which means that older cephates pulsate faster than the younger cephates. So if we observe that there is some change in the mean period uh, with the distance from the galactic center, we may, may, we may well expect that there will be an age distribution in the galaxy. And this is what we also um, looked into. And indeed, when we calculate ages of the classical cephates from the pay, period age relation and plot uh, these ages with different colors, this is what we see. This is the, uh, the same um, view from the top of the classical cephate distribution. And the different colors uh, mean different ages. And this is uh, shown on this uh, histogram here. So the purple color is around uh, 50 million years. Then the bluish is between 100 and 150. Green is about 200. And then yellow is about 300 million years. And what we see, he, see here is that even though the uh, cephates of different ages are distributed all over the galaxy, uh, there are structures of cephates uh, of the similar color, which means that there are structures of cephates that are of a similar age. And we, uh, to find out what that could mean we decided to uh, make a simple simulation. First, we divided the observed sample of cephates into three age bins. So the first age bin is the purple between 20 and 90 million years. The second is between 90 and 140 million years. And then from 140 to 160 million years. And these, uh, these distributions are shown here in the, in the 
a column in the right column. We see that there are really uh, well-defined structures formed by objects of, of the same age. And then we will try to trace the uh, trace the history of these surfaces and see what happened, what how what we have to do, what we have to assume to obtain the distribution that we observe now. So um, this will this will be a busy plot, and I will go over it slowly. Each row com, uh, corresponds to the different age bean. So so, uh, so the surfaces, the youngest bean is the top, the middle bean is the middle aged surface, and the bottom row is the oldest surface. Uh, so this is the the left column is the observed distribution of surface. This is exact, exactly the same uh, as we saw here in the right column. It's just that we um, plot all points with black dots. And uh, those spiral uh, uh, lines are the spiral arms and their endings are marked with uh, colors, so we will be able to trace their movement. Now, the middle uh, middle column is uh, what happened some time ago. This is the uh, the history. So, the first uh, row is what the galaxy looked like 64 million years ago. This is about a quarter of a rotation cycle of a galaxy because the full rotation cycle of a galaxy is about uh, 250 million years. So 64 million years ago, which is the median age of Cephids in this edge bin, the spiral arms were rotated, uh, back, had been rotated backwards. So the uh, yellow point here is now here and the green here is now here and so on. And we inject star formation episodes in several spiral arms. Here we inject those uh, star formation episodes in three spiral arms. Uh, this is because the stars are formed in the spiral arms due, because the gas density is sufficient in those areas to, for the star to form. And for in the middle panel, we rotate the galaxy by 114 million years backwards. This is the median age for this uh, cephates in this age group. And as you see, the spiral structure is rotated backwards by about half the uh, rotation cycle. And we inject one uh, star forming episode here and another there one here. And the same thing for the last age group, we rotate the galaxy as 175 million years backwards and inject uh, two star forming episodes in those arms. And then we follow, we run the simulation and see what happens uh, after the galaxy has uh, come to the current stage. And this is the result. So these purple points from the age bin after the galaxy has been rotated uh, by 64 million years until now, look look like this. And uh, for the middle panel and for the uh, bottom panel. And now we compare what we see from simulations with what was seen, is what we see in the data. And surprisingly, uh, we are able to uh, reconstruct those structures. They are not, of course, perfect because there are many physical parameters and uh, that go into such a, a simulation. And our simulation is very simple. It just assumes that stars are formed in spiral arms and after the galaxy rotates, um, they can, they are dispersed. This is because the, uh, the, the speed of stars is slightly different than the speed of the spiral pattern. And of course, stars that have some chaotic uh, velocities for themselves. And the surprising, really surprising thing is that the structures that we observe, that is here, are very similar to the simulated structures, which supports the hypothesis that classical cephites do not form uh, continuously uh, at all times in the life of the galaxy, but that stars form in bursts. And that is why the structures we observe now are of similar age, because stars form in uh, not in a continuous way, but in various episodes. 
And the same image, but now uh, the, the results of the simulation, but now uh, maybe in a nicer way are presented on this, um, on this movie. And you see that uh, stars appear at some time in the past. And as the stars move uh, around the galaxy and as the spiral structure rotates, we have the uh, change in the distribution. So maybe once again, uh, there, this is the simulation. The time runs here on top of the simulation. And we see that stars form in those same places as were shown in that uh, plot in the previous slide. And this is the comparison of uh, the simulation results on the left with the observed distribution of cephates on the right. And we see that the similarities are striking. So once again, uh, the conclusion here is that stars do not form in a continuous way, but they form rather in episodes of star formation in the spiral arms. And um, this is all that I prepared for today. I tried to uh, make it below 45 minutes uh, so you can attend the conference. And so thank you for your attention. And I'll happily answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much for this very nice and uh, and enlightening talk. Um, yes, indeed, we have uh, plenty of time for questions, even for those who want to attend the conference. So please either uh, just ask or raise your hand if you have any, yeah. any questions. Yes, Mikołaj? Uh, I, I have a question how exactly uh, these surface have been calibrated because you need to calibrate um, this distance luminosity relations if I understand correctly. Uh, do, do you use part of your sample to do it with the help of, I don't know, trigonometric parallaxes or do you use data from literature? So, uh, yes, yes, because uh, so this uh, for, depends, uh, depends on the um, region in which we use the surface. For example, uh, the period luminosity relation can be calibrated if we know the distance for the Magellanic clouds. And the image that I showed in the beginning was the period luminosity relation from the Magellanic, uh, large Magellanic cloud, to which we know the distance. But also the, uh, uh, the calibration, uh, uh, there are calibrations based on um, uh, the uh, high quality data from the Hubble telescope. There are calibrations based on um, uh, evolutionary uh, expect, uh, evolutionary codes. What we what luminosities do we expect from uh, from from the objects? Um, uh, neither, n this way or the other, the the calibration is very good for those period luminosity relations. So we can uh, rely on the distances just to. Um, uh, I didn't say this, but the maximum error on the uh, distance that arises not mostly from the period luminosity relation, but from the uh, extinction and infrared data calibration is uh, at maximum 5%. And uh, for many, they were about on, on, of the order of 3% the, the errors in distance calculation. Okay, thank you. Does your observation give any information about the presence or absence of dark matter in our galaxy? Uh, well, we, uh, so we still do not know what has caused the warping of the disk. And one of the theories is that that might be some uh, asymmetrical distribution of uh, dark matter, uh, but this uh, doesn't seem very likely. And the more likely explanation is rather that there was a collision with some dwarf satellite galaxy about two or 300 million years ago that uh, caused this warp. And then we think of the warp as a kind of a wave uh, that will fade away with time. But uh, the, the direct uh, connection uh, to dark matter is not um, constrained from the warp. Like I said, we still do not know what caused the warping. Okay, thanks. Bożena, you also have a question. 
Uh, yes, that's right. I, I didn't catch exactly your statement about age dependence in mm -hmm. this period. Uh, is it the same as metallicity dependence or it's kind of unrelated? And whether that may lead to some systematic uh, errors if you use uh, uh, C-fates in, uh, in other galaxies. Uh, so yes, this is a, a good question because uh, there is some metallicity dependence, and but we have accounted for the metallicity dependence in calculating the ages from uh, the periods. And this, uh, so this peri period age relation that uh, I have shown is uh, does uh, does account for for the uh, for the metallicity effect, but it is an intrinsic relation that the 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 older the surface become the they pulsate faster, and the, and this relation is uh, it this depends on metallicity, but it is not a result of the metallicity differences. So uh, there will be one more question from Piotr, but can I follow up on that? What is the reason why uh, older surfaces pulsate faster? Is this a physical mechanism? Uh, th that's the, um, so this is the, uh, uh, th this is also connected with the stellar evolution and with the mechanism of pulsations. So there are some instability. Um, there is this um, region in the um, color magnitude diagram called the instability strip. And this is some uh, specific range in the temperature, in the stellar temperature and luminosity uh, that uh, makes stars that enter this region, makes them pulsate. And there is this mechanism of, uh, um, of stellar pulsation uh, uh, that is um, in different layers of the stellar surface. So there is a, a layer of, uh, depending on the um, temperature of the star, it may be hydrogen, it might be helium, it might be, uh, it might be iron, but then there, depending on the star, the, this surface in the star uh, becomes op opaque to the light. So it accumulates photons from the star until it becomes so hot and, and ex expands and releases the photons. It's the ionization in that layer. So that makes the, uh, the star uh, pulsate, this, this layer of, um, uh, this ionized layer of hydrogen or helium or uh, iron, depending on the star. And what happens that this star during its evolution, it um, exceeds fuel in its core. So uh, cephates, um, uh, cephates are in the process of burning, uh, uh, of burning uh, helium uh, in their cores or the, Depends. Okay, I don't want to go into much detail. It depends which passage for the instability strip. Uh, depends also which uh, what is burned in in the core of the star. But then, as the uh, fuel uh, is being used up, the internal conditions change, and the temperature changes, and uh, the amount uh, um, of energy that the star produces. So also, it changes the instability. Uh, in that layer that causes, is responsible for pulsations. And that's what, how we observe it, that uh, the older the stars get, the more they, fuel ha they had used, the faster they start pulsating. And because cephates are large, uh, massive stars, it happens uh, on very uh, short time scales because their evolution is very fast. Uh, so that's why we can observe that in the distribution of cephates that we have. Uh, I don't know okay. if that answers the question. Yeah, th thanks. It was much uh, more, well longer than I expected. Uh, <laughs> by short yes. time scales, you probably mean millions of years. Yes. 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 That's... Okay, yes. Piotr, you have a question, please. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, I have a question concerning this uh, this matter of this uh, creation of the cephates in bursts. Because you said that the, the, the observations and the models you, you've created based on them, suggest that cephates were created in bursts. But if you if you would show us this chart, the distribution of the, the, the number of cephates by age, uh, this, the, the distribution seems to be rather continuous. And uh, those three age bins that you've created, they seem rather arbitrary, really. So, I mean, uh, 
I'm not really sure if I follow why exactly would the, the, the fact that, I mean, it looks like those satellites are kind of created near, near the galaxy center and they slowly migrate uh, to the galaxy border, right? Uh, but I mean, where's the argument that it actually has to happen in bursts? Uh, so, okay, uh, so, so if you, maybe let's look at uh, these images. Uh, so these Cephates in three different age bins is, uh, as you see here, they are uh, not all, um, let's look at the oldest age bin. They are not uh, created in the center, in those central parts, but in the outskirts. Uh, in the course of the rotation of the galaxy and in the course of the life of Cephates, they, uh, they are not able to migrate as much. So that's why the distribution here is, uh, uh, the, those distributions are in different distances from the galactic center, but yes, the more time has uh, passed, the more dispersed the distribution is. So the argument that they are formed in uh, bursts is that the structures here, uh, if maybe if we look at this image, maybe it's better visible, that this, there are surface of similar ages uh, forming some structures. So we do not, observe uh, all cephates of uh, all ages uh, in all areas uniformly distributed because then there would be just, uh, we would not see any structures with colors here. It would be just a, um, uh, a mix of all colored dots all over the place. And the fact that there are some, uh, uh, some uh, empty spaces, then some over densities, and those over densities are of similar color, means that they must have been formed at similar time in the past. If they were formed in uh, every five years, there was one Cephate, we wouldn't see those uh, structures. But because they are formed in some episodes, then there is a break and then there is an episode, we are able to see those over densities which have the similar color. Um, yes, these, these are uh, dispersed because a lot of time has passed. These are less dispersed. We see, a, we should, I think that this is a, a good hint of a spiral, a fragment of a spiral structure. And here there are probably those two, two spiral, uh, spiral structures. <laughs> for, for, uh, for, I don't know, does it, does it convince you or, or not yet? Okay, I, I understand. All right, the, the, this matter of this densities and under densities and over densities of, of those stars that, that wasn't obvious to me just, just from the picture, I admit. But mm -hmm. uh, still, I mean, if you look just, the, I'm sorry, but just a silly simple argument. If you just look at this graph for the distribution of the number of stars by age, I mean, it's continuous. The, on the graph, we see that, I mean, at each time, there is a more or less, well, I mean, the, 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 perhaps the, the, the speed of creation varies, but it doesn't vary in jumps, right? The, the, there are no, I mean, there's just one peak on the graph and no, 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 no just one big okay, peak. I, and, mm -hmm. right, I see. Another. Yes, I understand what you mean. Yes, of course. Uh, so uh, uh, in that sense, the, uh, Okay, maybe I uh, didn't uh, express this um, as I meant to. So uh, in that sense, the stars are being produced continuously in the galaxy. That is, uh, that is um, if, if we take into account the entire galaxy, yes, that is correct. Uh, but uh, those, so this, this, uh, this histogram on the, on the bottom is, uh, it's uh, fairly smooth. But then uh, if we place those uh, pins on the image, they fall in specific areas. So the purple part falls specifically here uh, and not all over the, the, the place. That is what I mean, that um, uh, these episodes make that plot uh, um, um, you not- You mean that separate creation at, at certain ages where we're just concentrated in certain parts of the galaxy. And yes, that, exactly that is what, uh, um, what I mean. All right. I think I understand now. Right? Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, yes, I, I'm sorry. Yes, if it's not clear. I, I think I think this is uh, there is some uh, background knowledge which uh, astronomers, uh, some astronomers will know that that goes into that uh, that you didn't have time to explain. I think. 
first of all, the knowledge that stars form in spiral arms, as you said, so they don't really form in other places in the galaxy. Uh, but can is, can you can you confirm that? Uh, is yes, yes, uh, that's because of the uh, there is there is a need of some certain density yes. to be able to contract to form. And a, then a, and a the star. second thing is that we more or less know I I think as as I remember from my <laughs> courses a bit a couple of years ago how spiral galaxies rotate. Yeah, I mean that what what that these spiral arms kind of rotate with the galaxy in a sense yes that, that... yes that's uh, that's also uh, that's also uh, one uh, one reason here that this the, the, the spiral pattern does not uh, rotate uh, in exactly the same way as the stars themselves as the orbits of individual stars around the galactic center yes yeah, so and i understand that if you combine those facts and what you see then then uh, this is what you get but of course one could maybe come up with some other simulations that uh, could be, I don't know, maybe showing something else. So I, I guess we don't have time to go into these details. Uh, does anybody else have a question? Because if not, I would still ask what would like to ask. Uh, okay, so my, my question would be, it is always suspicion suspicious when you see that uh, sun is somehow, you know, singled out and kind of your, res your results show that the warping stars just outside of the of the <laughs> orbit of the sun. It's always, you know, we don't want to be in a privileged place. Can be there any bias which which is related to that? Maybe that you know, in observations there is something that, in fact, the warping is not just outside of the sun, but it's just uh, some bias. Or maybe this is just a coincidence that we observe that. Have you investigated? Uh, so that? so okay. So um, with the new uh, so the new data that. Uh, uh, that I showed, so uh, the update with the, for example, the update with the uh, red dots changed uh, slightly our uh, equation of the uh, galactic disk surface. And in that uh, equation, the warping actually started already at um, uh, about 20,000 20, light years from the center. So um, maybe if you look here, uh, this is, uh, this uh, warping uh, more or less should start around here. It's not well visible on this image. It's just, um, we can say artistic vision, but uh, the new data suggests that the warping is slightly interior uh, with respect to the sun's orbit around the galactic mm -hmm. center. Uh, so this would uh, of course mean we are not that privileged. Okay, so, so uh, we might be already in this warped, warped area. Yes, but this uh, this is not um, this warping is mo most pronounced uh, in the outskirts where we mm -hmm. uh, where we uh, yeah. about twenty okay, sixty that, light that, years. It's really interesting. Uh, I, people already start to leave for the conference. But mm -hmm. For those of you who can afford one more minute, maybe uh, unless there are some other questions, uh, I still I was wondering about one more thing. Uh, so. You show this image of another galaxy which has this warping, and I guess there are more, more of galaxies which which have this pattern, or this is just one one example. How how is it? Uh, so yes, it is. Uh, it is assumed that about uh, fifty percent of the galaxies uh, show some warping. Uh, I mean the spiral galaxies. Yes. So so it's about half about half of the galaxies do show some sign of warping. But usually it is a, a small effect. The mm -hmm. effect that we observe in our Milky Way is observed in other galaxies, uh, but I uh, I don't think there are statistics on the um, any statistics on the uh, degree of the warping. What how often uh, mm -hmm. we see galaxies with certain degree of warping? There uh, we we do know some galaxies which are significantly warped. Definitely, it's not. Uh, very, very uh, common to be significantly warped. So in this way, we may be in some um, three or five percent of more warped galaxies. But it is also believed that uh, the warping is a, a temporary uh, mm -hmm. feature of the galaxy, uh, that it results from some, uh, for example, collision with a different galaxy uh, 
that uh, induces the wave and then it fades with time uh, and that, that that's that is the hypothesis uh, uh, that is highly probable uh, if we think that we observe warping in so many galaxies and that it is uh, variable yes so, so yes so that actually th this was something that i was wondering about that Obviously, if you have interacting galaxies, like say, like uh, uh, galaxies which are close to each other, uh, and then then warping and various things will be happening. But for our Milky Way, we are quite far from M31, so there will be interaction in the future, as far as we know. But at the moment, this cannot be the case, the the reason no. for for this behavior. No, it's, so yes, it's, it's too far so away. Are there any models? for other galaxies and also speculations for our galaxy. You, you already uh, mentioned that in the answer to professors, uh, Professor Białynski Birula's question. So is it sufficient that uh, like some dwarf galaxy passes through the, through the, through the disk to, for this to happen? Do you know how, how it is? Yes, yes, we, we do observe a number of, uh, I don't know, a dozen or so uh, dwarf galaxies uh, uh, that have some have had some interactions with the Milky Way and they are now torn apart. Uh, but these we, we do see signatures of those galaxies. And um, there was uh, one major collision. We think maybe it was with the Sagittarius uh, galaxy, which we now observe uh, as a Sagittarius stream. And there is the, the, the over density of uh, stars in the Sagittarius region. So it, the hypothesis is that maybe the, the collision with the Sagittarius galaxy, uh, which agrees uh, uh, in time and agrees in space might have caused the warping. Uh, there is also um, a hypothesis with the Magellanic clouds that are, uh, Magellanic clouds are the closest uh, pair of uh, uh, large dwarf galaxies that are satellites of the Milky Way. Uh, the models are still not consistent, but there are one, some of them uh, say that there was a close encounter of the galaxy Magellanic clouds and the Milky Way about two or three hundred million years ago. But, the, but this is not uh, certain because other models say that uh, the Magellanic clouds are only on their first uh, info into uh, on their first meeting with the galaxy. So, uh, this, okay. uh, yeah, we still well, do not know for sure. We probably need more observations to also constrain uh, various models. So, yes, we'll be looking forward to to your work and other of other observers. <laughs> it's very interesting, in my opinion. Thank uh, you. The tweet. Tracing our own Milky Way is sometimes more difficult than other galaxies because we exactly. are inside. Yes. Yes, okay, yes. so unless there is any final question, uh, I think we, we will be finishing. Uh, so thank you very much again. And it was a very nice, uh, very nice talk with very nice pictures uh, and uh, some new knowledge for many of us, I think. And thank you for, for inviting me. It was a pleasure to... And let's be <laughs> virtually. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.